Okay, well, let me read for us the text we're looking at this morning. Galatians 3, verses 15 through 18. I'm going to get a crash course in covenant theology in a certain sense. Um, uh, covenants, you know, are simply the ways in which different parties would relate to one another. Uh, we're familiar with the term covenant. Uh, actually, a marriage covenant is a covenant, and that also falls under the rubric of once in place, it, it remains in place, uh, unless, of course, broken. This doesn't talk about breaking of covenants. It just talks about how one covenant won't replace another in God's economy. Um, covenants can be fulfilled and, and can um, perhaps be removed in a certain sense, but, um, boy, you know, we can really get into a lot of things in this text, but let me just say this, that um, there is a, um, a uh, sort of a split. Well, there's always going to be people on any side of any equation, but there are those, when we talk about the uh, covenants remaining in force, there are those who would say even the Mosaic Covenant remains in force, and in a certain sense, it does, and, and we'll have to explore that as well. But what we want to focus on this morning is the fact that the Abrahamic covenant remains in force. So Galatians 3, 15 through 18. Paul writes, brethren, I speak in terms of human relations. Even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, is referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. What I am saying is this, the law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise. But God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. Now, if you don't get anything else this morning, get this. The Abrahamic covenant remains, which means the way of salvation is still the same as it was uh, for Abraham. Now, I think you see by now, Paul has been arguing for a gospel of pure grace. Our justification, our acceptance with God is completely a gift of His free grace received by faith alone. That's why the Reformers were so adamant about grace, you know, it, if it's to be by grace alone, it has to be received by faith alone. A gift can only be received, it cannot be earned. And he is arguing this over against the so-called gospel of the Judaizers. Again, Judaizers, the word simply means those Jews that wanted to make Gentiles into Jews. In their view, God does His part, but we also have to do ours, okay? They taught that we have to believe in Jesus as the Christ, but we also have to receive the old covenant sign of circumcision as Gentiles. We must become full proselytes to Judaism and as faithful Jews submit to the Mosaic ceremonial law. Hmm. Well, Peter said at the Jerusalem Council, as I've already mentioned before, this law was a burden that neither they nor their forefathers could bear. And again, I hope you've been reading Leviticus, because there you can see why that was such a burden. Thankfully, we don't have to bear it any longer. The Judaizers are wrong. Jesus has fulfilled it. All we need to do is trust Him, and let's not forget this other part, follow Him, okay? Being a Christian does not mean believing the facts. It means trusting in Jesus Christ to save you, and it means following Him. It means being led by His Spirit in His ways. Now, in chapter 3, Paul's given us several arguments to prove this point, and we need to remember these arguments so that we don't find ourselves falling into the same way of thinking as the Judaizers, and we often do. That, not that we have to become Jews, but we have our own system of works. That I'm not going to be convinced that I'm a Christian unless I am good enough for God to accept me. You know, there, there's a lot of people that actually teach that and believe that if you step out of line, you're no longer saved and you need to be saved again. That's not the way it works. If we're saved, God will, will not allow us to go too far from Him, but He'll keep us on that path. 
But still, we can find our way, ourselves thinking that. God's not going to accept me unless I'm good enough. But the point of the gospel is I am good enough in Christ. And if I'm trusting in Him, I am in Him, God accepts me. Now, I thought it would be interesting to review these arguments as we begin by way of question and answer, sort of like a justification catechism. You're familiar with catechisms, questions and answers. Don't expect you necessarily to know these answers, but I hope you're familiar with them at least. So let me put what Paul has said in question format and then answer the question. The first question is, why was Jesus crucified publicly? If we're saved by law, well... Okay, to show us that we could not be good enough through the law, we need Him. And the only sacrifice that can take away sins, that's why He was crucified and crucified publicly. How did you receive God's Spirit, the one we've been talking about that leads us in, in His ways? Was it through the law or was it through hearing with faith? Not through the law. I mean, we are strangers to the Spirit of God as long as we are under this covenant of works. But by hearing the gospel with faith, that's how we receive the Spirit. Well, if you receive the Spirit through the gospel so that you are enabled to trust in Christ and be justified, why would you now turn back to the law, which couldn't give you the Spirit? Well, Paul is going to argue to do so would be to reject Christ and to fall from grace. Actually, to be, it's to be separated from Him. So we don't want to do that. Why did you suffer for the gospel? Well, because we're convinced that the gospel is true. It's worth suffering anything we have to, to endure in order to arrive in heaven. And remember that Jesus did say that if we love him and are like him, we will suffer. Did God authenticate the messengers of the gospel or of the law with miracles? Not the messengers of the law, but those of the gospel which means the gospel is the truth. By the way, the, the teaching of the law as a way of salvation has never been God's way, so God is never going to endorse that with miracles. How was Abraham justified? By works or by faith? Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Again, thankfully, as we're going to see this morning, the Abrahamic covenant has not changed. How did God say he was going to justify the Gentiles? in the same way as Abraham. What does God say is true of everyone who tries to justify themselves through the law or through works? They are under the curse and God's wrath because no one can keep the law. What did God say was the only way to be justified in the old covenant? Well, we not only have the example of Abraham, but he said through faith, the righteous shall live by faith. And it doesn't mean that righteous, those who are righteous will live by faith and, and trusting God's promise to keep the law. If I keep it, I'll be saved. Basically, it's just the opposite, that the one who is righteous is the one who trusts in the, the promise of God, of the seed who is coming, and he will live. He will live eternally by the faith that he has in the coming Messiah. Why isn't keeping the law the same as living by faith? The one who practices the law will live by that law, not by Christ's righteousness. It can't be both. It has to be one or the other. And finally, what is the only way to be freed from the curse of the law? By trusting in the one who became a curse for us on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ. Every time we have the Lord's Supper, we need to remember that. Jesus has taken the curse on himself, our curse, so that we will not suffer the curse throughout all eternity. Well, Paul now continues his argument. Most of the Jews of his day believed that when God gave the law through Moses, he was introducing the way of reconciliation, the way of justification. They believed that he was saying, do this and you will live. Okay, the Pharisees certainly believed that. The Judaizers also seem to believe that. It, it's almost as if they totally missed how Abraham was justified and what the Lord said through Habakkuk so many years ago, the just or the righteous shall live by faith. They believed again. The Mosaic Covenant was a system of works. If they simply did what God required, 
they would be saved. And as we know on other occasions, the Jews seem to think simply being a child of Abraham and having circumcision was enough to be saved. But the Lord reminds them again and again, though the children of Israel be as the sand of the seashore in number, it's only the remnant that will be saved. Well, as over against this covenant being a way of salvation, a way of justification, Paul is going to argue two things. First of all, that the Mosaic covenant did not nullify. It did not replace the covenant that God made with Abraham. That's what we're going to look at this morning. But secondly, that he never intended the law to, to, to be a way of salvation. Okay, that's what we're going to look at next week where we see why God gave the law in the first place. So this morning, let's consider the first argument that the Mosaic Covenant did not do away with the Abrahamic Covenant, and we want to look at three things from our passage. The first one is covenants are permanent. Secondly, the covenant that He made with Abraham was not only with Him, but also with Christ, and that's very important, and it contained promises to both. And thirdly, that the Mosaic Covenant did not replace the Abrahamic covenant. That, that follows from the first point, I hope you see. But what this means is, because it didn't, the promises remain intact. So first of all, let's consider that covenants are permanent. And this has relevance really to all of us, not only from what we're looking at this morning, but even our own agreements that we make, our covenants. Paul says in verse 15, Brethren, I speak in terms of human relations. Even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now, in Scripture, there are different kinds of covenants. There are what are called parity covenants and what we might call suzerainty covenants. Okay, the first one is an agreement between two equal parties, parity. Okay, that's what parity means, between two equals. And one example of this is that made between Jacob and Laban. Uh, when, remember when Jacob left uh, Paddan Aram uh, with his numerous family and, and his possessions and Laban pursued him, okay? Um, there was a covenant that was made when they, got, when they caught up. Okay, I'm going to fill that out just a little bit more in a moment. But there's a second type of covenant which is one that is sovereignly imposed. It's called the suzerainty treaty because the suzerain is the the Lord, and He imposes it sovereignly on another party. That's the kind of covenant God made with Israel through Moses. He also made the same kind with, with Abraham, as a matter of fact. But for our purposes this morning, let, let's just use the example of the one He made with Moses when He delivered Israel from Egypt. Now, when a covenant is made, it contains certain stipulations, certain conditions. Jacob and Laban agreed that when they set this rock up and um, they, they made this agreement that neither of them would pass by that rock in order to do the other harm. Okay, that was the, the condition. When God made His covenant with His people Israel, when He brought them out of Egypt, He required that His people love Him and love each other as themselves according to His standard, His way of doing it, that's contained in the Ten Commandments. We call those stipulations, okay? Those are conditions. Okay, and then covenants also include sanctions. I know sanctions seems to have like a negative connotation, but it's positive and negative, okay? What they could expect if the covenant was kept, what they could expect if the covenant was broken. Okay, as long as Jacob and Laban kept their agreements, there would be peace between them. But if they passed by that rock in order to do each other harm, there would be war between them. If God's people kept God's covenant, there would be blessing. I don't know if you remember that for when we talk about Jesus taking the curse upon Himself. Paul actually referred to that passage of Scripture where, you know, God said um, that if you don't keep all the conditions, you'll be cursed. Well, we haven't kept the conditions. We've been cursed. Um, we come into this world under that curse. Well, the same thing here. God tells his people if they keep it, there'll be blessing. If they don't keep it, there's going to be curse. Now, covenants, what they really are, are legally binding contracts that contain the terms of the relationship that's being set up. 
and the rewards or the punishments based upon whether those terms are kept or not kept. Okay, that's, that's what a covenant is. Now, Paul tells us that once they're made, covenants can't be changed. They can't be set aside. Even those, he says, that are made between men, okay, or covenants of, of parity. You ever wonder what Jesus meant when he says in Matthew 5, 37, let your yes be yes and your no, no. Now, he is talking about how the Pharisees would make, you know, these verbal contracts and they would say, I'm going to do this, but then they had a way of fudging so they could get out of it. Jesus is saying, when, you're, when you vow something to God, you keep it. When you make a covenant, you keep it. Let your yes be yes, let your no be no. We are to mean what we say. Uh, what we promise, we are to do. Okay? So think about that. In, in all the agreements that you've made, you know, the righteous man swears to his own hurt and does not change. If you promise somebody you're going to do something, you need to do that, you need to follow through. In a marriage covenant, you've made promises, you need to follow through on those promises and keep them. Uh, church membership, Okay, any agreement, whenever we say we're going to do something, just as much as saying, I will do this, or, I will be there, this is true, this is not true, okay, all of these things are verbal contracts that we're making, and they need to be what we mean, they need to be true, okay, that's what our Lord is telling us. Now, Paul's point is this, that if that's true of our covenants, our verbal agreements, how much more is it true of God's covenants. Uh, Balaam the seer, who was not a righteous man in and of himself, but a prophet of God in, in the, uh, the days before the, uh, the, the prophets as we think of them, in Numbers 23, 19, said this about God. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Well, you know the answer to that. Okay, God is true. God will be true, though every man is a liar. And what this means is this. The Abrahamic covenant is still in force. Okay, that's Paul's point. Now, secondly, Paul tells us something about this covenant that we don't often think about. Maybe we do. And that is that it contained promises to Abraham, but it also contained promises to Christ. Okay, another reason why, still in force. Remember, this covenant is all about Christ. That's what the Abrahamic covenant is. But listen to what he says in verse 16. Now, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. And we might think he's talking here about the Jews until he says this. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. Now, this means two things. We know God made a promise to Abraham and to his descendants, even to the Jews. And yes, Abraham did have two seeds, as a matter of fact. He had his children through Sarah, and he had his children through Hagar, and he had his children through uh, Keturah, remember? He had lots of different family lines, and they were all legitimate. But God was only going to bring the blessing through the seed that came from Sarah. But notice again, even more specifically, that he makes this promise to Abraham and to Christ, okay? Because Christ, again, is what's behind this whole thing. Now, God promised to Abraham three things. He promised him the land of Canaan, okay? Genesis 13, verses 14 and 15. The Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had separated from him, now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, I will give it to you and to your descendants forever. God made a promise to Abraham that he would give him many children. Okay? He says in chapter 13, verse 16 of Genesis, I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth. So if anyone can number the dust of the earth, then your descendants can also be numbered. And then thirdly, he made him a promise that through a particular descendant of his, through his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Genesis 22, verse 18. In your seed, 
All the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And again, God gave Abraham the grace to be able to obey him. Abraham had already been justified by trusting in him. But he proved that he knew the Lord because he was being led by the Spirit. Okay. God, and now let me get this for a moment now, because this is a highly disputed point in theology today. And we differ with a vast majority of, of churches on this particular point. God fulfilled these promises to Abraham, all of them, okay? Now, I'm not going to get into what difference that makes, but those of you who are familiar with this debate will see the point. So, did he give him, first of all, the land? Well, we read in Joshua 21, verse 43, so the Lord gave Israel all the land which he had sworn to give to their fathers, and they possessed it and lived in it. Now, here's a catechism question for you. Did God give Abraham all the land he had promised to give him? Yes or no? Well, according to Joshua, he did. In Deuteronomy 1 verse 10, did God answer the, the um, promise to give him a seed as numerous as the sand? He says, the Lord your God has multiplied you. This is Moses speaking to Israel before he brings them into the land he has multiplied you, and behold, you are this day like the stars of heaven in number. Yes, he fulfilled that. And what about the promise that through his seed, all the nations will be blessed? Well, through his seed, through his descendants, he has given one, through whom all the nations have been blessed. And as we know, this is an ongoing work. They shall be blessed as the kingdom of heaven moves forward through evangelism. Okay, so we're familiar with that. God made promises to Abraham. He kept them. But he also made promises to Christ. And these promises he made to Abraham that we've seen that he has fulfilled literally, physically, are actually shadows or types or promises of those promises he made to Jesus, the seed of Abraham. So the promise he made to Christ that, um, that he would give him the land of Canaan actually pictured something much greater and that is the earth. Remember how Jesus says in the Beatitudes, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit, for there's the kingdom. But he says, blessed are you who are meek, for you shall inherit the earth. He also takes the uh, promise that's given um, in, in the Ten Commandments, where he says, I think it's the one where he says, um, honor your father and mother, that your days may, pro may be prolonged upon the earth, which the Lord your God gives you. In the New Covenant, uh, Paul uses that same quotes that same um, commandment, and he says that, you know, the children are blessed who keep this, who honor their parents, because they will inherit not just the land, but they will inherit the earth. Christ has been promised the earth, of which Canaan was really just a picture. We read in Psalm 2, verses 7 and 8, I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord, he said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. He's speaking, of course, to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He would be the one who would be given the, the nations and the earth as his possession. He would rule over the kingdoms of the earth. Isaiah 9 verse 6 for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, uh, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. He was given a promise that his kingdom would grow until it filled the entire earth. Uh, Isaiah 9, verse 7, there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. And let's not forget King Nebuchadnezzar's dream statue, the stone cut without hands that smashes the statue's feet and then it grows into a great mountain that fills the whole earth. When Daniel was interpreting that image to King Nebuchadnezzar, he said that in the days of those kings, which was the days of Rome, God's going to set up a kingdom that is going to fill the entire earth, okay? That is no end to the increase of his government. 
And this will ultimately culminate in the new heavens and the new earth. Canaan really pictures the new earth that Jesus brought through his work, and he will bring it one day when he makes all things new again, which is what Paul is talking about in Romans 8, verses 20 and 21, where he writes this. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And what Paul is saying here is that when the children of God are revealed, which they are when Christ returns, he's going to make the, the entire creation new again. And that is the promise that God has made to Christ for his work. God also promised him children, just like he did Abraham. He promised that he would have many children, but these children would be those who trust in him. They would be given to him as a reward, Isaiah 53, verse 10. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And through his work, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And that's where all these children were going to come from. And that's what John means in 1 John 2, verse 2. And he himself, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, is the propitiation for our sins. He is the one who satisfies God's justice for the curse that was ours. He took the curse, remember, and carried it away. He himself is the propitiation for our sins, that is, for us Jews, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world, also for the Gentiles. Now again, once a covenant is made, it can't be set aside, it can't be changed. God made a covenant with Abraham that he fulfilled, and he also made a covenant with Christ, which he is still bringing to pass, okay? And that brings us to our final point. The Mosaic Covenant did not displace the Abrahamic Covenant. It did not replace the Abrahamic Covenant. It didn't negate it. It didn't do away with it. It's still in force, verses 17 and 18. What I am saying is this. The law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise, but God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. So what Paul is saying here, of course, is that um, as that covenant with Abraham still stands, the way of justification, the way that Abraham is justified still stands. Now, Paul, if, if he were to fill this out a little bit, we would tell us that this covenant that God made with Abraham was ratified. And all of God's covenants that he makes, the ones that, that he imposed, not the one that, that people make necessarily, although sometimes it's true of them as well, but all the covenants that God makes, he ratifies them by sacrifice, which means there is blood that is shed, okay? That was the case in the covenant made with Abraham, as I'll point out in just a moment. When God made the covenant through Moses, he sprinkled the, the tablets and the people with blood. Uh, when the new covenant is made... That's ratified by the blood of Christ, okay? Well, when God made the, prima, the, the promise to Abraham, it actually it comes, comes later. I don't know if, you, if you were listening on Wednesday to the um, lecture that R.C. Sproul gave about the Last Supper, he pointed out that in the upper room, Jesus instituted the new covenant. He gave the terms of the new covenant. He basically laid it out. But it wasn't ratified until the next day when Jesus dies on the cross. Well, in the same way with the Abrahamic covenant, God made the covenant with Abraham, but it was ratified a little bit later. And see if you recall this. Uh, he told Abraham to take these animals and, and to cut them in half. And, uh, you know, when you cut animals in half, obviously there's going to be a little bit of blood spilled. And that blood, as you know, was representing the sacrifice of Christ. Um, but also that blood represented what would happen to either party 
who are making the covenant, if either of them should break the covenant, then what they're saying is, may this, what's happened to these animals, cut in half, may that happen to me. May my blood shed and may I also be killed if I should break these terms. But if you remember when God made that covenant with Abraham, he caused a deep sleep to fall on Abraham after he cut the animals. And God appeared in a theophany and he goes between the pieces by himself, calling, as it were, the curses down upon himself if this covenant should be broken. Okay? And what he was showing us was that he was going to make sure that covenant was kept. And it also shows us that he was going to take the curse of the broken covenant, because that covenant was broken, upon himself so that those who trust in his son would be saved. That's what the death of Christ was all about. Again, he was taking the curse upon himself. That's what all the shed blood was about. The one who sins shall die. So Jesus died to take away the curse of our sin. Now Paul has already told us that once a covenant is ratified, no one can set it aside or add conditions to it. So the law, which he says comes 430 years later, does not nullify, it does not abolish the Abrahamic covenant. It still remains in force. Matthew Henry writes this, when a deed is executed or articles of agreement are sealed, both parties are bound and it is too late then to settle things otherwise. And therefore, it is not to be supposed that by the subsequent law, the covenant of God should be vacated. So what he's saying is basically what we're looking at, right? God made these terms through Abraham. The law which comes later does not set that covenant aside. So what that means is this. The promise of the inheritance of eternal life is still received by faith. If we're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And let's remember what that means, okay? It doesn't mean I just believe that He is the Savior and that I know what this is all about. That's, that's not what it means. It means knowing what these things are all about. I'm trusting Him, His obedience, His sacrifice on the cross to make me acceptable. How, why, why am I trusting Him? Because Jesus says that if we sense the burden of our sins and we're weary of it, to come to Him and He will give us life. So He makes a promise to us. Everyone who comes to Him and trusts in Him will be saved. So it means that we are relying upon Him. We are resting in Him. All of our hope is placed upon Him for entering into heaven. That's what it means that Abraham believed God. It doesn't mean that he just believed the promise that he made. You know, I, I know God is true. I know he's going to do this. But he was trusting in that one who was coming. Remember Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad, okay, because he knew the Savior was coming, who was going to save him and make him right with God. So we need to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've already seen the, the evidence that we really are trusting and hoping in Jesus and Jesus alone is that we are being led by the Spirit. We are following Him as He leads us in the same footsteps our Lord Jesus Christ walked, you know, walking in His steps. All right. The promise is the same. Mosaic covenant did not change anything. So that leaves us with another question. If God didn't give the Mosaic Covenant to replace the Abrahamic Covenant, if He didn't give it as a way of salvation, why did He give it in the first place? Well, that's what Paul is going to answer next time. So as we think about, though, what we have seen, let's not miss, again, the point we are saved by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we need to think about as we prepare to come to the table, because the table is for those who are trusting Jesus Christ and Him alone for salvation. So let's spend just a few moments asking the Lord to um, uh, just to help us search our hearts on this and to make sure that we are trusting Him and following Him, that we have that evidence of turning from our sins and, and walking in His ways because by the Spirit of God, that's what we want to do. 
So let's spend a few moments in prayer.